Let's just take a moment and pray. Lord, um, we're so grateful for your presence here now. And Lord, that uh, we want to be made more like you. <clears throat> we need to overcome, Lord, our absence to be in your presence, Lord. That we're, Lord, we're absent when you call on our name. So help us be present. Help us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, work in our hearts and our minds so that we can be changed and transformed as a re result of being in your presence so we could leave here different from the way that we came in. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in week two of our new series, uh, and uh, it, our series is, is uh, the evidence of faith and looking at kind of the different ways how that should be visible in our life or our understanding of that. And for those who are in the faith, faith is the essence of a Christian life. If you don't have faith, you're not in the Christian life. When you have faith, it's the essence of, of who we are as Christians. Matter of fact, it says in Hebrews 11:6 that without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God. That without it, it's impo without it, it's impossible to be in a relationship with God. Without it, it's impossible that we have to have that faith. Now, faith is trusting God with confidence that he will fulfill his promise. That's faith. That's saying, Lord, I trust you and I'm, I'm confident in your word is true and that you will see to completion those promises that you've made in your word in my life, that you will see that through, that I have that faith, I understand. Now, that evidence of faith is a visible sign of a person's life in Christ. That there's this sign of faith that uh, becomes visible in a person's life. How it's displayed through a transformed life. Remember, we're, we become a new what in Christ? A new creation. Our minds renewed. We're, we're renewed in Christ. No longer are we who we were that second before, but in a sense we are who we are, yet transformed and made new in Christ. We're this new creation. When that happens, that, that transformation should display through our motives and actions. In other words, that's what should be changed. If, if my motives and actions are the same and I'm saying I'm in Christ, as they were when I really wasn't in Christ, something's wrong. It's like, I know my motives and my actions have changed now who I am in Christ. They just changed. My goals are different. My, my, my desires of my heart are different. I like people more. You know, things like that. That, that I can have compassion. That I can, so I'm outside. So that's the evidence of that change of that faith, that change in us. Now, great faith is trusting in God's authority through our obedience for the benefit of others. That's really great faith. We think great faith is for the benefit of us. But to have great faith, to have that, you know, faith is, is, is continuing to grow in our lives as long as we allow it. That we can continue to grow in our faith. And we can continue to have a, a greater faith. And we're called to this place of this greater faith. It's trusting in God's authority. And we trust in God's authority through being obedient, through that obedience. But its result is to benefit others as a result of our great faith. There's only two times in the New Testament where it said Jesus was amazed. It says he was amazed. When Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth, Jesus was amazed at their what? Their little faith. He was amazed. Said he could only do a few miracles. It was a bad day. Just a couple miracles. But he was amazed. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The second time is the healing of the centurion's servant. Scripture says Jesus was amazed at his what? Great faith. He was amazed at his great faith faith. We pray the centurion's prayer every week at the end of the Eucharistic prayers. We're praying a centurion's prayer. And that prayer we pray is, Lord, I'm not worthy to enter under your roof. Just say the what? Word, and I shall be healed. 
That was his prayer. In other words, I'm a man under authority. He was a Gentile, and yet he came to have faith. He actually came to have a greater faith in believing who Jesus was. So here he understands the authority. He shows the obedience. And then his faith was for a greater work in someone else. And he says, Lord, I don't need you to come to my house. You just say the word and my servant would be healed. That greater faith, and it's our faith, or it's the lack of faith that seems to get the Lord's attention. But it's great faith that he desires for each of us to have. So in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of this testimony of those who were named in Hebrews 11. When he says, therefore, being surrounded by such a great, he's saying, therefore, in chapter 11, that great cloud of witnesses are those that I mentioned like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, Samson, and David. That's just to name a few of part of that great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us. And that great cloud of witnesses are these heroes of the faith, or they're the evidence of faith. Witnesses in heaven, what you need to understand when they say that, are not spectators. Witnesses in heaven, they're testifiers of the truth of faith. That their lives are continuing to testify of who God is. That that continues to happen. And for us to have faith like those who've gone before us, it's going to take two things to understand this text in Hebrews chapter 12. It's going to take two things. The first thing is overcoming obstacles. The second thing is running with endurance. In Hebrews 12, 1, it describes a race of faith. And that race of faith is not a sprint, not something that happens instantly, but it's a marathon. It's a process. It's something that will happen over time. And that we have to learn that we're going to enter into this race of faith. First thing we'll have to do is overcome obstacles to be in that race. And overcoming obstacles is laying aside the sin which might ensnare us. That's, That's the obstacle that we're facing. The weight is anything that's hindering a runner. Anything that would be holding back a runner. And no one who competes in a marathon would add weight for the race. Right? Here's two 25-pound dumbbells. Go get them. No one would, in their right mind would do that. Unless, of course, you're Lucas Bates, who in 2019 entered the London Marathon dressed as Big Ben. He was setting out to break a Guinness World Record for the fastest marathon runner dressed as a landmark. (laughs) So he's going to break this record. He dresses as Big Ben. It was a London marathon, so that's why it's Big Ben. And he sets out. He adds on the weight. And he sets out for this marathon. And he gets... To the end of the marathon, he's completing the marathon. When he finally gets there, what happens is he gets stuck in the arch because his Big Ben costume's too tall and he can't finish (laughs) the finish line. He can't cross the finish line. He's stuck in the arch. He had to have people come now and assist him to get unstuck and across and finish the race. And unfortunately, he didn't break the record. And it wasn't because he was stuck the whole time. He lost it by a few minutes, that he couldn't complete it. He didn't break the record. But here's the question or that analogy that we should look at. What is our weight that so easily entangles us? What's going on in our life right now? What is our weight? What is keeping us from running the race of faith? What's keeping us from finishing well? What's keeping us from crossing that finish line? What, what obstacle do I have to remove in my life right now? What is that weight? What's, what's holding me back? Well, if you understand the definition of that weight, the weight we carry is sin. That's the weight. There's sin that we're dealing with, and sin is the obstacle that keeps us from a race of faith. 
It, it holds us back. Now we know, Scripture says that we can overcome sin through repentance. That we turn from those ways, we confess those things, we come into this relationship with Christ, but we still continue to confess our sins, to bring those things that are entangling us to light, to continue so that we can stay on that race that's set before us. That's how we remove those obstacles, so that we're not allowing that weight to keep us from being in that race. The second thing that we have to do is we need to learn what it means running with endurance. And running with endurance is participating in the race that's set before us. That's what we're called to do, that we're going to run with this endurance that I'm preparing for the race that's set before me. And we have to have uh, faith and recognize that we're not nearly spectators, but we're called to participate in the race. That we're, we're participating. We're not on the sideline cheering on the runner and handing them water. You're in the race. You're running alongside. So I was watching the other day, it came on and, and uh, you know, it intrigued me and it was a qualifying race for the Olympics. And as I was watching, I began to realize something looked a little different. Did you know that they have someone in those long races to, to get those qualifications? They have someone who begins to run in that race who actually begins to set the pace for all the other runners. So if you ever watch those longer runs, there's someone out there in front and everyone's thinking the same thing. Oh, that person's not going to last. There's no way they can keep running at that pace for so long to get the distance that they want to get. And, and they have that, that, that person begin to go out and they start the race. And then they keep them on that race so that they can set the pace for all the other runners. That's, that's the objective of what they're doing. So they're running ahead. They're setting the pace for the rest of the runners. And they'll hold that up for a good time till there comes a point where they go and they exit the race. They're not, they're not no longer uh, running in the race, but now they've exited the race. And they're called pace setters or they're called pace makers. This gives that runner every opportunity, not just to finish the race, not just to qualify, but to win. It gives them every opportunity. I think Jesus missed it in the Beatitudes. There's no blessed are the pacemakers, but there's the peacemakers. But we should understand what that pacemaker is. See, the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us have set the pace for our race of faith. They're the pacemakers. They're the ones who began to set that, that they came for a season and that they led away and they've set the pace for our faith, the evidence of faith. And then we too run. And then when they exit the race, they're entering into glory and they're continuing to cheer us on. That was their time and their season to set that pace. Do you know each one of us are called to be a pacemaker, a pace setter? That we're called to run that race. You know what? I want to give you a little word of encouragement. You're having difficulty in your family right now, or you're dealing with struggles in your family, or set the pace. Set the pace. You're having difficulty in another place, set the pace. Become the pacemaker. Continue on that race of faith that God has prepared for you. Now, I'm a runner. I run every day. I run four miles a day. And what that does is it keeps my sanity. It lets me spend time with God. It, it lets me multitask. I listen to podcasts. I listen to audible books. And it's, it's an hour of time I get to be with the Lord in the process of my exercise that is just a discipline, a routine I put in many years ago. And I kind of feel like as I've put those things in, it's, it's kept me sane, but really um, uh, it allowed other things. I run with my wife. It's a time for us to catch up, although she probably doesn't appreciate me calling that a date, but it's really not. It's but time. That, this is a date, right? 
But what does running do? All of a sudden, running reduces the stress, it, it keeps us healthy, and then it, it balances us. It creates this balance as a result of that exercise. So, so you know, there's my prayer life, my, my spiritual life that uh, is so important. But as I'm, as I'm running, I'm, I'm exercising, that I'm, I'm, I'm building my spiritual life, I'm building my mental life, I'm building my physical life, and they're all coming together. And it feels like as I've created those things in my life or those disciplines, it's kept me on the path that I'm called to be on, that it helps me hear God better, that it's just moving me and keeping me in the right direction. And part of me feels like, you know, it's, if you pull one of those cards out, you know, the house of cards will fall or whatever that is. And, um, but the truth is that it, it, it pulls together those things. And so I enjoy it. And, and, and the other morning I was out for a run and it was one of those days that wasn't easy. You know, no, I don't usually wake up every morning and go, woohoo, I can't wait, you know. Here we go again. Most people don't wake up. But I appreciate it. I like it. I woke up, and, and the run was more work than usual. I was like, what's going on? And I started thinking, why can't I run this race? What, what am I doing? That, was it my diet? Did I not get enough sleep? What's, what's holding me back? What is it? Well, I continued to finish the run and do what I did, and I came back, and I checked my phone and the weather, and I realized that the heat index was 107 degrees. So maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe that had part of what was weighing me down and holding me back in that moment. But you see, it's in times like that I remember to run with endurance, that I, I begin to fix my eyes on the things that are ahead. I begin to look forward on what's in front of me. And faith that endures is pursuing God and overcoming our obstacles. That's faith that endures. To have faith that endures, what we're going to have to deal with is suffering. And we can't go around it. We have to deal with sin. We have to deal with trials. We have to deal with challenges. We have to deal with hardships and the things that we're facing. And I truly believe one of the challenges we're facing in the church right now is over these past two and a half years, we've experienced suffering in a way that we've never experienced it before. The world became upside down. And, and we began to have restrictions and we didn't understand and there was sickness and death and, and just things we were facing unlike we've ever faced in our lifetime and there was suffering that ensued as a result of facing a pandemic and all the other things in the culture that was going on. And what happened in the midst of that, what happened during that as a result of that suffering, people left the faith. They turned. Now, I also believe those who've turned from the faith had more of a consumer faith. In other words, I'm only in this as long as it remains easy. When it gets hard, I'm out. Jesus never came to make consumers. His plan was to build disciples. Consumers, consumers take, disciples give. Consumers quit, disciples press on. And if we're going to have faith, it has to be one that endures. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, it says this, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. When's the last time you rattled that one off, right? Uh, Paul, I don't think so. We rejoice, say we rejoice in our sufferings. But do you know why? He clarifies, he says, this is why, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Suffering produces a faith that endures. Suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces what, church? Character. And character produces what? Hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Hope will not put you to shame. You know why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. That we can endure. Our suffering produces that endurance. That endurance builds our character so that we can run that race of faith. And our character is being built to be more like Christ and less like the world. That's the character He's building in each of us. That we'll have a faith that endures. And then we can hold on to that hope, knowing that hope. See, without hope and love, we cannot run the race of faith. 
We have to recognize whatever challenge you're facing right now, whatever that is, that challenge can lead to endurance. That endurance will lead to building your character. And as your character is built, you'll grow in that hope. You'll grow in that hope. Now, here's what you have to hold on to. Here's what we need to hear. Listen to me, church. The Lord is not working in your past. You might be stuck in it. He's not working in it. And how many people are living in their past? I can't tell you. People are telling me about their high school years, and it was 30 years ago. I'm like, really? This is still relevant? It's a lifetime ago. What's God doing right now? That it, he's not working in our past. He's working in our present. And he gives us a hope for a future, and then what he gives us is a faith that endures. Amen? Amen? Yes. Let's pray. Father, you know our sufferings. You know our trials. You know our tribulations. You know our sin. You know our struggle. And Lord, you're there in them. Lord, you're the one who comes and gives us strength through your Holy Spirit to endure the thing that we're facing. And I don't know where you are right now. I don't know your journey. I don't know if you're in the faith, you're searching for the faith. But I want to give you an opportunity to respond to faith, that you can have a faith that endures. And the way that you have a faith that endures is you've got to come to a relationship with who Jesus is. He makes an invitation. By grace through faith, we have to accept the invitation that he makes. So I want to invite you now. I don't know your heart. You know your heart. He knows your heart. What I know is he's after your heart because he loves you. And if you'd like to know him in that way and begin that faith journey and that race of faith, just pray this prayer after me in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I open the door of my heart. I ask you to come in. Take control of my life and make me the person you want me to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you pray with me, the most important thing to do is let us know we're committed to a pathway of discipleship. You're going to discover God's plan, God's purpose, and God's power being made known in your life. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue to worship the Lord in taking up our tithes and our offerings.